Now, I feel that I should point out that I won't be doing anything on the Beckhams. Victoria and David are very keen to do everything right, you know, to fit in with the LA scene. Because uh, all the celebrities now have a pet as a fashion accessory. Um, David and Victoria were told that the most stylish pets are small and yappy and fit into a handbag. They've got one called Tom Cruise. <laughs> Bless him, you know, but that's okay because he's very, very famous and proper celebrities are tiny. They're teeny, weeny, tinsy people. Honestly, I met Kylie Minogue once. She's lovely, but she's so small. I was given tweezers to shake her hand. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine, leisure that could reach for the stars. So long, let years long. You can do with new telekinetical optiothermic mascara. Have I told you how long my lashes are? Where they are, they really are. Could it be the new high-definition thermic rotating hardhead for brushing with an inbuilt Kino Fleno stiff stroking system for extra separation and density? They're so long, so thick. That's because they're computer generated. <laughs> Lengthen lashes to infinity and beyond. For out of this world lashes, take your lashes beyond your solar system and freak an alien out. Lun Royale, for lashes that really get you noticed. Because I'm worth it and you're I'm comfort eating. <laughs> now, who can think of a reason why Henry would be very keen that his brother didn't remarry? Didn't want to buy another present. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good, Gernon. Anyone else? Are you married, miss? I don't see what that's got to do with the Judas mark. No, but are you, though? Well, if I was, would you be calling me Miss Marlowe? Hmm? Now then. Have you got a boyfriend, though? No, Dean, that is definitely none of your business. Have you done it, Miss? Don't be so cheeky. Come on, let's get back to our work. Are you still a virgin, Miss? No, I'm not a bloody virgin, you little bastard! And have you know I have done it! I have done it! I tell you, it wasn't a dream! I did it in the laundry room of the Kendall Youth Hostel with a bearded German Etiquette for the modern woman in six easy lessons. <laughs> Lesson four, fighting. When you're one over the age, it's very important for a would-be ladette to give as good as she gets in any set to or scrap. Forget the Queensbury rules, girls. When some slappers elbowed you on the dance floor, you must cast all daintiness aside and kick your opponent's secret garden. Or to use a common vernacular, slam her in the camel toe. <laughs> At her, girl. Now plant your forehead on the bridge of her nose, 
or to use the colloquial parlance, give her a damn good nutting. <laughs> That's it. Pull her hair lovely. Oh, and be sure to accompany each blow with foul and filthy language. Filthy cow whore. <laughs> Emily. Remember, girl, LTD, lose that dignity. Good afternoon. <laughs> we return to the world's next much-needed top model. Welcome back to the world's next much-needed top model. We, the judges, have whittled down our girls to just three. Three of you have one thing in common. You're not quite as pretty as me. The girls had a surprise visit from a top fashion designer. The ideas they come to me all the time. They prance across the field like the little bar lamps, for I'm country boy at heart, you know. Or they're like big, strong, hairy men, slightly sweaty, who wrestle me to the ground. <laughs> Manchester United, I love my football. I give the girls and the women of the street, uh, if you're knowing what I'm meaning, the thing they are wanting in their heart's bottom. You know, a great man once said, only the most perfect physical specimens can be considered members of the master race who will rule over the world for a thousand generations. See Kyle, see Kyle. Starting with Brandy, what do you think, top fashion photographer Mike Norman? Cool. Thanks, Mike. Let's have a look at Yana. Missy P. All dressed up with nowhere to go, little lady. <laughs> That's because the lady is a tramp. <laughs> so, Yana, the judges think you have great eyes. They also say the rest of you is just slightly too ugly. Twiggy? Cool, lummy. <laughs> so, Sarah, let's have a look at your best shot you did from today's photo shoot. in my hands. They are both of me. I never tire of looking at them. I have another two photographs. The girl whose picture is not here must go. Walk out the door. Just turn around now. You're not welcome anymore. Sarah, you have achieved what is considered to be the perfect shape for a top model. You are a negative dress size and are now weightless. <laughs> However, you are at risk of becoming antimatter, and if you come into contact with matter, the result would be total annihilation. So, are you worth that risk? The judges say, yes. Congratulations, sir. You are still in the running to becoming the world's next much-needed top model. Go, blimey! Hello, National Rail Inquiries. You want to go from Mumbai to Bangalore? Right, well, there's one, I guess, in that 1444. Oh, wait, I say 1444. I'm not so sure if that's your team or our team. Right, first class will be 2,357 rupees for at-seat service, but I can get you there for 300 if you don't mind sharing with a chicken, 150 if you take your own seat, and 10 if you'll sit with the English cricket team. <laughs> right, I'll put you down for first class. Well, it may be inconvenient to talk to someone on the other side of the world, but at least I'm cheap. Well, actually, I know a lot about India. I can who Mowgli is. And I've been to the Bay of Bengal. 
Josie, do you remember that dodgy sagaloo? The next morning you thought I'd taken a snare drum into the toilet. Okay, so where were we? Hello? Hello? Going? Some people. Do you need any tea towels, Mrs? Curious thing. I haven't dried anything since 34. I just let everything drip. Do come in. <laughs> so there I was, lying in bed, sandwiched between Mary and Faithful and Ronnie Corbett. Good love to whom and in what position I shall never know, but I seem to remember it was all rather cosy, and we were debating the influence of French existentialist philosophers on contemporary American writers while passing around a naughty pipe. Not pot, you understand. I never dabbled with soft drugs. Oh, no, definitely not. I was strictly a Class A girl. I'm a bit of a snob in that respect, I have to confess. Got a taste for opium in China when I was teaching a Taoist scout group. After the Japanese invasion, they very kindly all took me up the Yangtze. <laughs> oh, happy, happy days. I've got dusters and those chamois are good. Sold a few of those. Oh, I've no doubt you have. So there we all were in bed. I started blowing softly on a harmonica. Someone joined in on a washboard and we jammed till dawn. Then we all tumbled onto a Vespa and motored to Brighton. And that's how I became the fifth member of Herman and the Hermits. <laughs> but sadly, after my first gig, I became terribly ill. The worst thing that could happen to anyone in the 60s. Turns out I was allergic to the Moog synthesizer. <laughs> My head swelled up to the side of a bubble car, and I spent the next eight years in a sanatorium for the criminally insane just outside Hove. God knows how I coped, but of course in those days one just did. One muddled through. <laughs> I'm sorry, what are we here for again? Dunno. <laughs> Oh, sometimes you think you know where you're going in life and all of a sudden the carpet is pulled from right under your feet and you're lost and you don't know which way to turn, which path to follow, which road to tread. And then you got to look deep inside yourself, right into your soul, further than you ever thought was possible. And you got to find that inspiration from somewhere so you can make that decision, make that choice, that choice you never thought you'd have to make. And no matter how much you try and shrug it off, it's always there, right behind you, haunting at you, grabbing at your coattails, snapping at your heels. And then you can't put it off no longer. And you got to come out with it even if it's right or wrong. And you stand there in front of me in your highfalutin suit and your slick back hair and you start calling like the cat who's got the cream and you've got no idea how much I've deliberated over this until it's driven me so crazy, I tell you. So is that red or white? <laughs> hey, you. Umberto, baby, I love the new Tash. Extensions. No way. Yes way. Oh, I get up and greet you, but my leotard's all locked up here. Ooh like one of my old hits. Borderline? Into the groove. Ooh. Hey, I'm getting really big on this room. What are you going to put in here? You know, I hadn't given it much thought. Oh, Madge, 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 Madge. When will my clients ever learn? You've got to start seeing accessories as being an integral part of design. I'm still reading from that job I did last spring. I'm not going to mention any names. <gasps> But it was Angelina Jolie. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we've sorted out the cushions, the drapes, the flooring. All the soft furnishings are still harmonized. We're done. Everything is perfectly coordinated. Oh, that is so great. As you know, Brad is a total design nut. He's obsessed that everything matches. Oh, my God. You forgot one thing. What is that? The children. <laughs> Oh, God, you're so right. There I was, thinking clean lines and natural fabrics, and I forgot completely about the accessories. <laughs> Let's have a look. <laughs> okay, straight up, I can see we've got a problem with this one. Who, Maddox? Oh, I know, I know. I got him when all that kind of beige taupe thing was going on. <laughs> he looks so in vogue on the butter footstool. 
But now I look at him and all I see is passe. I mean, adorable. But passe. Yes. His very last season. You want to know the Vietnamese look would fade so quickly. What should I do? Do you want to keep him? Who, Maddox? Of course I do. I love him. He will come back into fashion, won't he? In a year or two? Maybe. Maybe not. But this Eastern European look is very strong and it's going to be around for a while. Now, what to do? Mm. Well, first thing, keep him out in the hallway. He just about works there around all those orange and sepia tones. It's very yang. You'll hardly notice he's there. What about down the lounge? Under no circumstances let him in there. He will not work with a new sofa. You are so right. Honey, no sofa from now on, you'll jar. <laughs> but thinking ahead for a moment, number four, I want to go a bit further from home, something more exotic. Mm. Okay. Can I look at those watches again? <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking more modeled, slightly blue. But what about this one? Hmm? Latvian. Too blue. Hang on, that one. That's it. Perfect. So classic, so clean, so pale, really minimal. What's that called again? Jordy? Umberto, don't be such a bitch. I can't believe you talk about children like this. They're human beings. Jordy. Do you think that would go with Malawi Sunrise? <laughs> Jobs they shouldn't have done. Number 43A. Uh... Problem with your epi, your epi, your scheme. You have to take four face pills a day. That's uh, two in the morning, and then in the evening, that's another. Uh, let's see, uh, one, uh, what, a few more, and then you're right, right. Sorry, are you actually qualified? Thing is, I might cause drowsiness, so you won't be able to do any. You know what, with your missus. You know, tomorrow, I think I'm going to booper. What you do with her is your own business. <laughs> Same, not the drowsy. Oh, disgusting. I want a second opinion. All right, it's off his foot then. Is it? I don't know, but it's a second opinion. <laughs> Be up, baby. What are you staring at, you skinny bitch? <laughs> There's been a mother in your life, and I have to tell you, and you might not like this, she was older than you. I <laughs> sure knew that. You're not a stranger to trousers, are you? You have trousers in your life. I'm seeing work in some capacity. I'm seeing a job, I'm seeing a job, I'm seeing a job. Do you, now this is a long shot, get up in the morning. <laughs> I'm seeing jam, I'm seeing marmalade, I'm seeing heat apply to bread. <laughs> Melvin says hello. Who? Oh, you don't know him. He doesn't know you. He just says hello. <laughs> I've got the gift, see? <laughs> Hi, I'm Shelley.
Kelly Craig on the inside looking out at who's hot, who's not, who's out, who's in, who's halfway in and halfway out, who's approaching in but still predominantly out, who was never out but is always in, and who is in, in, and out, out. Here in Hollywood, anybody who's anybody has a must-have celebrity accessory, a stalker. Nothing says I've made it like a creepy weirdo following you about and leaving inappropriate suggestions in your mailbox. <laughs> Hence the success of a new business enterprise that, for a prize, will provide you with a stalker you need to prove you've arrived. This is Look Who's Stalking on 14th and Mahalan from where Billy Jackson runs the world's first ever stalking agency. Well, I started off as a stalker. I became obsessed with a daytime soap opera actress. I found out where she lived. I hung around there. I sent her flowers and did the usual regular deal. And when I got arrested, it made the papers. And when the court case happened, it made TV. And the actress got a lot of publicity from it. And what did you get out of it? Well, I got six months. <laughs> so, when I got out, I said to myself, hey, there's a gap in the market here. Because you see, celebrities need stalkers, and stalkers need celebrities. What can I say? And what do you say? Well, usually I say, I know where you live. <laughs> Hello, look who's stalking. Can I put you on hold? Hello, LWS. What are you looking for? All oh, right, I've got a fat guy with a beard who's very good at hanging around bushes available at the moment. <laughs> yes, he's wheezy. You want to book him? But isn't it a terrifying ordeal? Well, it depends on what level you go for. You can go for the bookish, geekish, harmless stalker. <laughs> or you can go for the I'm gonna dismember your fiancé with an axe type of stalker. I'll just put you down for a standard follow and bother, shall I? What you get, what you pay for. Uh, stalking that would culminate in a high-profile court case with full media circus would take... Well, eight to nine months with two weeks paid vacation and dental. <laughs> Whereas a crazy lady in an orange hat who hangs around your hotel lobby... Well, that's relatively affordable. <laughs> so, there you have it. Here in Hollywood, even the loom balls come at a price. This is Shelley Craig saying, stay away from my house, you freaks. <laughs> You're carrying scissors in your bag, sir. Yes, I'm a hairdresser. We're off to shoot a calendar. I'll have to confiscate these, sir. Oh. And I'm afraid no liquids allowed in the hand luggage either. Oh, dear. I suppose you better have this as well. Conditioner. Hair gel. What about the mousse? Good idea. Let's ask her. You carrying any liquids? We've had Lord of the Rings. Harry Potter. Narnia. And now, another British classic is brought to the silver screen. Punch and Judy. Al Pacino is Punch, a man close to breaking point. Ladies and jelly spoons, I'm very squeezed to meet you. Renee Zellweger is Judy, the wife who can take no more. Oh, Punch, I loved you once. But you're not the man you used to be. Yeah? Are you try being a man when you got a hand stuck in a place where the sun don't shine? Uh, what attracted me to the role of Judy was her toughness. Um, I mean, here's a woman who, in the face of um, horrible domestic violence... ...is willing to give her husband one last chance and let him look after the baby. And what does he do? Hit it with a stick. What makes you think you're going to arrest me? You company man. You cog in the wheel. Now come along quietly, Mr. Crunch. We don't want no trouble. Ow! 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 
He's at a crossroads in his life. Doesn't know which path to follow. Should he hit law enforcement officers, his wife, or his child? It's Mr. Pottinella to you. You f I spent months with very close friends, just hitting them with sticks. It was very important and gave me the truth of the role. Sir Anthony Hopkins is the crocodile. I mean, what a huge honor to work with Sir Anthony, a real life English whalesman. <laughs> But I was driving in my open-top Chevy all the way from Tierra del Fuego to Anchorage, the way you do, and he flagged me down and said, uh, fancy playing a crocodile. And I thought, hmm, never done a croc before, a bit of a challenge. So off I went, intense preparation, swallowing alarm clocks, all that. Then it struck me, ah, wrong end of the swizzle stick. Not that croc. So, you thought you could steal the sausages from me? You fairy. Your child. <laughs> Total absence of dialogue. Came as a bit of a shock. Still, show must go on. Snap, snap. Ah. I won't give the ending away, but it involves sausages. They're not worth it, Mr. Punch. Wow, no! There were three of us in this marriage. You, me, and pork produce. But, Mr. Bunch, you were always my sausage. Oh, Judy. Hello? Yep. I've got to tell you, Mary says hello. But not, not now, I'm busy, all right? Yes. No more than that. She's calling to you. No, just clear off, will you? I'm sensing pain. A lot of pain. Yep. Friday. Yep. Yep. Well, there should be something. Oh! Now, we know anything goes in Little Britain. Snot, sick, even Vanessa Feltz at Fat Fighters. No, that's a step too far. Anyway, that's next here on BBC One. Later, Mylene Class from the People's Quiz joins Jonathan Ross after the news. <laughs> 